Hello again. So um, it's my very great, great pleasure to introduce Dan Jeffries. I first met Dan, I think, at a Novel Nights, I think it was in 2015, no, 2014 possibly. It was when Juliet Pickering, a literary agent, came to talk to us. And Dan was in the audience and he said, I've got an idea for a book. Um, and I don't think you finished it at that point. So it's been absolutely fascinating to sort of get to know Dan and to sort of see the journey from being in the audience at Novel Nights to actually him crowdfunding his book. And here it is. Um, and it was what, published two years ago now, wasn't it, Dan? Probably, yeah. yeah, yeah. Anyway, very warm welcome to Dan, um, who's going to talk to us all tonight about um, the world of online. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think we're all going to get a lot from tonight because Dan knows his, knows his stuff. Yeah. Anyway, very warm welcome to Jan Def Dan Jeffries. Thanks very much. Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me on Facebook? We're streaming live on Facebook. Don't worry, you, you won't be seen. It's all about me. Anyway. Prologue. I step out of the shower, reach for a towel, and look at myself in the mirror. <laughs> On the sink is a bottle of Alpacin, hair revitalizer, half full now, must get a new one off eBay. I pick it up, squirt some into my thinning hair, and gently rub it in with my large hands. I glance back up at the mirror again, wince at my uncomfortable features, and contemplate how utterly pointless this is. I lick my lips and examine my teeth. I like these. Thankfully, teeth don't thin. A minute or so later, I stop rubbing my head like a chimp with ADHD, and I reach out for my glasses, missing them at first, groping around until I find them. I raise them up to my head and place them over my ears, a ritual I have performed a million times before. I look in the mirror once again. Now I'm in focus. Town, drinks, socialising, strangers, I think to myself, and roll my eyes at my own self-doubt. I'm off to meet Ian, my old school friend, to celebrate his birthday. He's 36, just like me. I cross my living room to the bedroom. House music blares from my speakers. Millie sits on the sofa, licking her paws. Her head pops up as I cross the room, and her little eyes follow me intently. She's totally nonplussed by the noise, and I hope it's because she's old and deaf and not because she thinks I have shit taste in music. Inside the bedroom, I open my wardrobe and think about what to wear. Casual, smart casual, or impressive. I know old school friends will be there, some I haven't seen for years. I know they'll probably be married or engaged or have kids. I know that I'll be the single one. Hey! Maybe I'll find the love of my life there. I go casual. <laughs> Bristol, Friday night, 8 p.m. We're meeting down on the waterfront, which means walking down Park Street and crossing the city centre. I weave my way through the rippling, sorry, I weave my way through the drunken melee of short skirts and rippling torsos, conscious that I might do my usual trick of accidentally bumping into someone with arms like the Incredible Hulk. Thankfully, this time, I don't. I arrive at the restaurant and scan the large open space. The common challenge of trying to see where people are now, uh, where people are now raises its ugly head. Are they here? Will they see me? Balls. I should have texted Ian to tell him to keep an eye out for me, something I'd normally do. I can't see them, so I cross to the bar and order myself a vodka and Diet Coke. Whilst there, I think I spot someone standing next to me that I went to school with. He doesn't recognise me, and I'm not surprised. 18 years can change a man. Eventually, Ian turns up. He shakes hands with the guy I'm standing next to, turns to me, and exclaims, Hello, monkey! I'm introduced to the chap next to me, and of course we immediately recognise one another, and it's, How are you? God, has it been that long? A few more people turn up, and as is the way with Bristol, we all start to realise that we already know each other through mutual friends. 
Phew, I can start to relax a bit. I order another vodka. A waiter comes and tells us our table is ready, and we casually wander over. Weirdly, there are not enough places at the table, but now that I'm buoyed up on vodka, or pissed as it's more commonly known, and feeling part of the group, I grab a spare chair and seat myself at the head of the table, like I'm the court jester in residence. I'm sat next to Merv, the guy at the bar, and his girlfriend, plus another couple I don't know. I'm on good form now, more comfortable now that I'm at the centre of attention and not on the periphery. So, Dan, Ian tells me you work in music, asks Merv's girlfriend, Danielle. Yep, music education. I write my own music, DJ a bit, and run my own label, too. Really? That's pretty exciting. Have you been doing that for long? I reach out to grab my drink and knock hers over by mistake. Shit, I'm so sorry. My eyesight is rubbish. I can't always see what's around me. Danielle smiles as we clean up the mess. Oh, don't worry about it. Have your eyes always been like that? And so it begins. I know that I'm about to tell the story and tell it to a group of people that have never heard it before. I'll see their jaws drop, their eyes widen, their mouths curl in sadness and ripple with laughter. I order another drink and one for Danielle. 30 minutes later and the story is told. I see the emotions written across the faces of my audience. Shock, surprise, pity, disbelief. Questions are asked, drinks are bought. We decide to skip dessert. I turn to Danielle. I bet you wish you'd never asked, I joke. She looks at me, thinks for a second, and then utters a phrase I will never forget. You should write a book. <laughs> a smile creeps across my face like the sun at the dawn of creation. <laughs> a book, you say? Now there's a good idea. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I'm sorry, Jeff. Can I get rid of this? Hello, is that, can you hear me okay if I speak like that? That's me. Hello. My name's Dan Jeffries, and I'm very, very rare. <laughs> Snap. So I was born with a condition called Wyburn-Mason syndrome. And in a nutshell, Wyburn-Mason syndrome, also known as Bonnet de Champ Blonde syndrome, or retinoencephalofacial angiomatosis, is a rare condition that is characterized by arteriovenous malformations the effect that affect the retina, the visual pathways, the midbrain, and the facial structures. It's usually unilateral and is often asymptomatic. Now, I don't know what half of that means either, but just in case you're not quite sure what a retinoencephalofacial angiomatosis is, I'll do my very best to explain. So, a... Uh, oh no, I've skipped Mr. Slide. So, an arteriovenous malformation simply put, is a tangle of blood vessels. And it often sits around the brain uh, and can sit around the eye. And in my case, uh, it's left me completely blind in my left eye. That's completely blind, no light, shapes, shadows, nothing. Uh, this is a x-ray or a picture of a normal, healthy eye. It's my right eye. That's my left eye. So you can see like these, we call them the worms, these big veins. So you can understand why there's not much light and sight getting through those eyes. But to look at me as a kid, you'd think I was pretty normal. Well, that is until you see that picture. <laughs> and then it all goes wrong. Now that, ladies and gentlemen, is the start of my usual presentation when I'm doing my talk about being rare. And as we know, this, tonight's presentation is more about social media and crowdfunding and other subjects. So I'm not going to be able to tell you my entire story tonight, because I've only got 45 minutes. But if I do another talk, I'd love you to come and see it. Well, there are some books down there as well, which tell the whole story. Look at those. They tell the whole story too. And I'll be doing some signed copies at the end if anyone's intrigued. Uh, you'll also, if you get to see the talk or buy the book, figure out what all these pictures are for. 
And again, I'm not going to explain those to you now. They're just to wet your whistle. So tonight, what are we doing? We're doing a presentation called How to Make a Book. And I'm going to try and sort of impart some of my wisdom and knowledge that I have. Uh, I think it's important to make you aware of a couple of things, though. I'm not a career author. I am a one-off book man. I'm going to write, or I've written one book, and it's one book only. So my approach to marketing and crowdfunding and social media may be different to those who are writing a series, etc., etc. So you have to bear that in mind. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background, that's me and Richard. I think Richard's just made a joke about how many emails I send him uh, and how annoying that was, or not. Um, Oh, yes, yeah, so Richard, as I was about to get on to, there he is. Uh, There's a live version over here. He's over there, so I'll put the red light on him. Uh, he's the owner and, uh, what's your official title? Publisher. Publisher of Tangent Books. And I'm very proud that my book is released through Tangent Books. Um, I originally looked at the self-publishing route, and I contacted Richard through a mutual friend who read the book, and... Thankfully, I was going to say loved it, and I will say loved it. He enjoyed it and wanted to work with it. Um, and I realised that I wanted to work with a publisher because I had no idea about the technicalities of publishing, ISBN numbers, getting it into bookshops, all of that kind of stuff. And uh, Richard's approach was exactly what I was after. He didn't want to edit the book particularly. He didn't want to change anything about it. He just wanted to release it as it was. And I was perfectly happy for that. And we've had a fantastic relationship since then. Um, so, we're going to look at three areas tonight, if that's okay. Crowdfunding, marketing, and the audiobook, and how to produce an audiobook. So we're going to start off with crowdfunding. So, there are lots of different options. You're aware of what crowdfunding is. You uh, propose an idea or a project, and people will back it uh, hopefully, to get some rewards. There are lots and lots of different options. Kickstarter is probably the most famous one, and that's who I did mine with. But there are pros and cons to Kickstarter, which we'll come on to in a minute. And I was just looking to see what other sites were out there. Now, for example, I found this one called Crowdfunder. Crowdfunder, UK only, from what I could see, or prim primarily UK-based. Kickstarter, primarily US-based. So you might want to think about your audience and your reach. And I did a search and I found about 1,500 uh, uh, crowdfunding projects on this website related to publishing. Okay? And as you can see, we've got a few here. And I picked this one here called For the Old Country. It had 31 supporters. His target's £3,500. He's got about 17 days left. So, let's look at the key information. He's raised about, like I say, just under £1,300. But look at this down here. This project is using flexible funding and will receive all the pledges made by a certain date. So if he only gets 2,400, he will get 2,400. If you're on Kickstarter and you've asked for 3,500, if you don't reach it, you don't get it. All right? Big, big difference. So you have to really think about what you're trying to aim for and what the purpose is of your project. Having a, having a crowdfunding campaign massively helps raise your awareness as well because you're going to shout about it, people are going to share it, they're going to be excited that they're part of a project too. Now rewards are like a really key factor and there's all these different sites offer, offer different options. And this guy, for example, only had one reward at £50 and you get a copy. I don't know if anyone knows him, I, I wish. <laughs> uh, so... To me, that's quite a lot to pledge to get a reward. And I looked at my reward scheme very differently. But people do it in different ways. So, my first tip, cost it up. This is the most important thing, and the one thing I kind of regret not doing enough of, really. You're going to have to pay for any materials that you send out as part of your reward scheme. You're going to have to pay for the postage. That was the biggest thing I forgot. And I had bloody people from the States that I'd forgotten that had come, uh, uh, um, contributed. So I'm looking at 14, 15 pounds a book to send over, which I'd forgotten about. So cost it up, it's really important. So here's a couple of my pledges that I did. This was the early bird special. 
We've sold 41 backers, which was great. So a copy of the ebook, okay, that doesn't really cost anything. Your name listed on the web app, that didn't cost anything. A signed copy of the printed book, well, that obviously cost something. And look, anywhere in the world, <laughs> that might have been an oversight. So think about who you're sending it to. And if you are going to send it to anywhere in the world, include the postage in your costings. Otherwise, you'll just end up with no money. A higher one over here, £25. Copy of the ebook, name on the web app, one signed copy. But also, these didn't really cost much. A thank you in the book, that's fine. And everyone got um, a little pocket, ironic po pocket mirror, uh, which was great. But again, think about the costings, think about the printing, think about the envelopes. There's lots of things to think about. Number two, actually creating the campaign. So again, the different sites approach it in different ways. Kickstarter love a video, and I think a video is really important. There are different ways you can make videos. You could use PowerPoint to make a video if you wanted to, but if you really want to reach out to your audience, try and get as professional a video as possible. So I worked with a friend of mine who's a designer, and we went around Bristol with a, uh, it was just a, a DLSR, a camera like Otilia has over there, with a microphone on it so we had some good sound and we shot lots of footage. And then I used a website called Wee Video, which is a fantastic tool, doesn't cost very much, loads of effects, really easy to make your video. So uh, that was a great help. Now once we got the video out, we got it up on the Kickstarter page as you can see there. Uh, a really strong holding image is important too, so again, people are gonna notice it. So let's have a look at the breakdown of the actual uh, campaign. So you're writing, so you need to show good writing, I think. Uh, people want to read what you've done, if you've done anything. People tend not to want to back an idea. They want to back something that's in process or is underway. So one of the things that I did was offered a PDF of the first couple of chapters, which you could download, even an ebook version, which I just mocked up. So if someone's on their tablet or phone and they want to have a quick read, they can do that too. Tell them what the money is going to be used for. I have seen people say, I'm after £5,000 and I'm basically going to take six months off work to write a book. Now, I probably wouldn't give someone £100 for them to have a sabbatical so they can write a book that hasn't been structured. There's no information about it. Tell them what the money is going to be used for, and people feel more confident that this will have an end result and it will achieve its target. Okay, so be transparent. And then the next thing was I started to make some sort of artwork. I look half naked in that picture. I should have cut it off there, really. <laughs> but Kickstarter is go, so shout it on Facebook. Let people know that your campaign is underway. The other thing is, if you can, and this is not easy, but if you can, Get as many people as you can to back your campaign on the first day. Because if Kickstarter and other websites see this hive and flurry of activity on day one, they're going to notice that, and they will probably promote it, put it in there, you know, things to look out for, whatever it might be. If you don't get any activity, they're not going to be bothered. It's incredibly difficult. You're up against companies that are producing uh, technology and gadgets with, you know, asking for hundreds of thousands of pounds. It's not easy. My third tip, if you're not very good at design, if you're not very good at marketing, if you don't really know how social media works, get some help. This does not necessarily mean you have to ask friends. There are services out there where you don't have to pay a great deal of money, but you will get the results. Has anyone heard of People Per Hour, for example? Freelance website. So you can find someone, for example, let's say, we'll look at this a bit later on, you need to mine 200 reviewers off Amazon. Well, I wouldn't want to sit and do that, but there is someone out there that you pay them enough, they will do it. Get some help. Uh, if you do want to design it yourself and you fancy a go, cannot recommend this website enough, Canva. It is a free design website, and it's fantastic for social media design. And I'll tell you why, because you get all of these templates so you probably don't know, um, that's an assumption, but you may not know the dimensions of a Facebook post, or you may not know the best dimensions of a uh, infographic or a Twitter post. This has it all there for you, and all you have to do is go and design it. 
You get lots of templates down the side. They all look fantastic. And you just change the text as you see fit. Save it, whack it up onto Facebook, Twitter, whatever you want to do. It is a brilliant tool, and I can't recommend it enough. Your next step, promote your campaign. Don't be bashful. Your book and your Kickstarter is a product, and you want to raise money. You need to shout about it in the best ways possible. So I got in touch with Bristol Evening Post, who love a headline. Man with two rare medical conditions, <laughs> Penn's memoir on his extraordinary medical history. Which, you know, it's true, and I, you know, I, I can't thank them enough for it. Facebook stats, always important, three and a half people thousand, three and a half thousand people reached. How many contributed to the Kickstarter campaign off of that? No. None, probably. <laughs> Nobody knows. It's very hard to know the conversion rate of an advert like this or an article to actual funding. It's difficult to know. So, made in, uh, sorry, uh, Evening Post or Bristol Post. Made in Bristol TV, contacted them. They came and shot a thing because it was a Kickstarter campaign. Made in Bristol TV are constantly looking for content. Uh, Radio Bristol, Dr. Phil Hammond. So I obviously had a medical story, so Radio Bristol and Laura Rowlings, I think, did an interview on her Saturday morning as well. Radio Bristol are always looking for content. Get in touch. And then I started to make some adverts or little images just to let people know about how the campaign was doing. These pictures make sense when you read the book. Slightly rude, but they do make sense. Uh, and then once I'd reached my target, shout about it. So, you know, we did it. Thank people. Uh, took a screenshot off, of, um, off Kickstarter. 132 backers, 3,500 raised, 65 minutes left. Just in case there's that one person that thinks, yeah, no, I've got an hour, I need to be a part of it. And then, once I'd had chats with Richard, it was time to shout about the publishing deal. So a couple of big glasses of champagne. And do you know what? This is the power of the image. People are going to notice that and think, what's this to do with? He's obviously celebrating something, and they'll therefore kind of read it. I'd rather that in a line of text than 10 lines of text and no picture. So sort of think about your impact. Uh, and then, uh, once the book uh, was undergoing the printing process, uh, I got the first draft through, or the first copies, and I was able to share a couple of pages. And going back to Kickstarter, everyone that had backed uh, received an extra section from the book. So reward your backers with bonus content. They will love that. They want to feel special. I'm hoping the audio plays on this. So this was probably the biggest video that I shared. Memorable for two things. One, it was my sister's birthday. Uh, and two, because of this. Let's hope the audio works. No! Is that on the... Can you check the mixer? Just to your left. Can you see if... I'm going to go back a step. There's a big mixing desk there. There is indeed. And just... All the levels are down. Is there one that says... That's the mic. That's the mic. Just nudge all the rest up and let's see what happens. Sorry, sorry about this. Technical hitch, technical hitch. Oh, I'm playing it. No, Hold Joy? No, it's not. I might have to skip it. I'll skip it for the sake of time. Can but this video was about... Mind? No, I don't think it's going to work. No, sorry, nothing... Will this was the day that my books got delivered. So this is when... You'll see it in a minute. I'm saying, well, I've just been to the gym, I was really knackered. And then suddenly, 500 books appeared from the postman which was just an amazing thing to receive. And it was the first time I'd ever seen... Uh, there they are. It was the first time I'd ever seen a copy of the book. And it was, it was a brilliant moment. I almost cried it was that good. <laughs> we'll skip that. So, uh, we're almost done on, uh, social media, uh, on uh, Kickstarter. Rewards, 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 rewards. So, I did some printed materials that went with it. Uh, the mirrors... I think for a hundred pounds you could have dinner with me. No one was bothered about that. But <laughs> some people like to have those rewards. Um, also, people will share their content on Facebook. I didn't ask them to do this. These were people that I knew, okay, admittedly friends of mine, but they're sharing videos, opening the book, taking the piss, which is brilliant. You know, you want to see people engaging with it. Can't ask for more. That's just amazing um, promo material. And this is really key. I can't stress this enough. 
If you can get your book or copy of your book out weeks in advance before the official launch date, people, as you can see here, reviewed it the day it went live on Amazon. Now that has a lot of kudos because it doesn't necessarily raise the rankings in any way, but people are able to see that this new book that's just been launched is having an impact. And it's really, really key. So even if you just send the ebook version out a few weeks in advance before the print version, people have got the chance to read it before they uh, leave their review. That's, uh, I think, an essential tip. So, my top tips. Find the best social media, uh, sorry, the best crowdfunding platform that works for you. Work out your costs. Can't stress that enough. Find someone to work with. If you're not a designer, if you don't want to use the software or design your own products, try and find someone that can help you. Offer the incentives. They're important. And schedule your updates. So make sure that you're letting people know how the project's progressing. It's really key. Okay. That's me done on uh, um, crowdfunding. Let's have a little bit of a look at marketing. Now, marketing is a dark art, as far as I'm concerned. There's no right or wrong. There's different ways you can do it. You can be obscure, obvious, commercial, however you want to do it. I think the main things for me are think about your audience and be as creative as you can be. So I'm going to explore three main areas, Facebook, Twitter, and Goodreads, which people may not have expected as a marketing uh, tool. Let's look at Twitter, first of all. Everyone's favourite. Hands up if you're on Twitter. Hands up if you have no idea what Twitter does. Oh, okay. So about half the room on Twitter, which is good. I still think this is kind of relevant as a... As a uh, <laughs> some people get it. Some people are like, I have no idea what that means. So Twitter is still a difficult thing to get your head around sometimes. And I often find with Twitter, it's like shouting into a cave. You put your post up, no one acknowledges it. Or you don't think they do. You have no idea if people have read it. It's very hard to engage with the stats and know if people are taking on board what you're saying. So my first question is, do you need it? If you're not going to invest the time into keeping it updated, is it worth having a Twitter account in the first place? Now, there, are, there is a particularly good tool which I use called uh, Plugio, isn't it? Plugio. It's free to a point. And what it will do is it will let you manage your Twitter account in a much more interesting way. So, what you can do, for example, is search for, you could say, I want to find people who've got an interest in books within a radius of 50 miles of Bristol. And it will find all of those accounts for you. And then you start following them. But if they don't follow you back, they suggest you get rid of them. Because what's the point? You're following 600 people, but you've only got 200 followers. What's the point? So they suggest a ratio of one to one, followers to followees. Uh, so this is a very good way of filtering out and purging uh, people that don't follow you anymore. Or, or don't follow you in the first place. Because what's the point? So... Uh, it's worth looking at Plugio. Another really fantastic tool, anyone here use Chrome? Hands up if you use Chrome as an internet browser? Most people do. You need this, I think. This is called TweetDeck. TweetDeck is a uh, free plugin. You can manage multiple Twitter accounts. You can set up multiple columns. I've got about six or seven. You could say, I want to filter everyone who reads books within the Bristol area, and then it will just show those people on those posts. Um, you see we've got novel nights there, so you can just follow everything. One of the best things is that you can schedule tweets. This is what a lot of people don't do. They forget about Twitter. Actually, you could spend Monday morning, type up 10 tweets, schedule them throughout the week, and forget about it. And that really is a clever way of doing it. Because, okay, you're going to react to certain things now and again, but you know you want to promote stuff, schedule them. It's really, really useful. Okay, Facebook. This is my Facebook page. Well, sort of. This is the back end of my Facebook page. It looks kind of frightening, but this is all the key information that if you have a Facebook page, you need to be looking at. Is any, who's, I'm going to guess 
90% of people in the room are on Facebook. Who has their own author page? One, two, three. Okay, a few. Personal profiles are fine. You need your own author page. I can't stress it enough. Because you need to try and raise a following that aren't your family and friends. Your family and friends will tell you what they want to hear on the whole. You need to be engaging with strangers. And by doing so, by having a page, you can't get this information on your own personal profile. You can only get this through a Facebook page. So let's have a look at a few posts that I've made over time. So you can see what the post is. These are all analytics that you can get. How many people it reached? How many people engaged? An engagement might be a click or watched a video uh, or uh, something like that. You can see one down here, engaged with lots. Uh, I think, which one was that? I can't read that one. Well, yeah, okay. Let's have a look at an example. This is when I launched the audiobook out now. So, we zoom in. Uh, 55 reactions, lots of likes. So we can see how it's broken down. Somebody didn't like it. They hit the post. That's really useful to know. If you see that half of the people hide it, you know that you're not doing something right. So, the video that we didn't watch earlier, 7,500 people reached. Reached. Doesn't mean viewed. Reached. Big difference. 3,500 views. Oh, I'm pretty happy with 3,500 people watching my video. Let's look at the stats. Minutes viewed, 1,243. Okay. 10 second views, 793. So 793 people switched off after 10 seconds. Right? Average watch time, 21 seconds. It is a minute and a half video. Suddenly, that 3,500 doesn't look quite so good, does it? Now, I kind of ignore this and go, no, 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 no. 3,500, that's the key number. But this is what's really important. And you can see the dip as people start watching the video. Now, maybe I don't talk or show the boxes of books until about 40 seconds in. All that preamble at the start, who cares? And that's because I just thought, you know what, I'm going to pick up my phone, all these books have arrived, I'm just going to do it. And I start talking about being at the gym, my arms, no one cares. Show them the books, that's what they want to see. So all that preamble at the start probably cost me quite a few viewers. Um, so very useful stats, I think. So I went to see Sue Perkins at the Colston Hall. And uh, Sue Perkins, um, she did a show very similar to mine, copying my ideas, reading out bits of the book, <laughs> big, big, big slideshow. But right at the very end, um, she did a Q&A. And everyone's asking questions about Bake Off and you know, all of this kind of stuff. And I was sat right at the back of the Colston Hall, and I was waving my arm like this, and she finally caught me as the last question. And I said, Sue, as a fellow pituitary patient, I just wondered what it was like discovering that you had prolactinoma and how it affected your family and career. And the whole of the Colston Hall went, and it went dead quiet. And it took her by surprise. So, of course, at the end of the show, I went over with a friend of mine, had a copy of the book waiting in advance, because I knew she had a pituitary condition, and I gave her a copy of the book, and we had a really nice chat, and she said she'd follow me on Twitter, but she never did. Uh, <laughs> so, of course, we got some photos, and I posted it up on Facebook. Let's have a look at a few important things to think about to reach your maximum audience. Number one, tag Sue Perkins, so it's in blue. Number two, tag the Colston Hall. So that's important too, and also tag the friend that I was with. Let's have a look at the stats. I don't think you can't see it, it's just off the screen, I think. 40,000 plus views this post had. Uh, because Sue Perkins reposted it. So her entire army of followers saw this post. And you can just see the content that it generated. Now, one of the most important things, if I just go back a slide, uh, it's just off the screen. It had about 200 plus likes. Probably about three quarters of those people I didn't know. And you can click on that bit where it says, Hartong Wilkins, your mum and someone else, and 230 other people like this post. If you click on that link, it gives you a list of all the names, and you can invite all of those people to like your page. So it is a really easy way to gather more of an audience of people that are interested in your book, potentially. 
without having to pay any money. So a little bit more of a breakdown. Uh, so 6,500 people reached, uh, over 1,000 engaged, and you can see again the stats, how many people clicked the photos to have a look at them. How many liked my page off the back of it? Three. <laughs> you know, that's the raw truth. But I was able to invite over 150 people, and I'd say 30 or 40 signed up. Another picture, look at the stats. Women in blue, men in green, Age range, 25 to 44. And some in the 45 to 54 bracket. So if you are going to make an advert, don't bother aiming for the under 18s or to 24s. Probably don't aim for the over 60s. So use this information to target your audience when you make an advert. So my final thoughts on uh, social media. Content rules, pictures, videos. Facebook love it. Facebook would rather you upload a video to their page to their site than share a YouTube video. Don't bother, you can put it on YouTube as well. They will always share content that's on their site more. It's the, it's the world we live in. Timing is everything. What is the most popular time? I'm going to have a drink while you think about this. What is the best time of the week to put a Facebook post up? Sunday evening. Any more Sunday evening? Tuesday. Monday? Thursday afternoon. Thursday afternoon? I tell you, Thursday and Friday, about 7 p.m. It's the end of the week. People are not thinking about work so much. Kids are going to bed. People are checking their phones more. It's a good time to do it. There's no guarantee. Don't bother with weekends. People don't, they want a break from Facebook, especially if they've got families, they're busy. Weekends are a waste of time. It's unfortunate if you've got an event at the weekend. Weekends are much harder to, uh, to target. Target your audience. If you're going to do an advert, think about who you're aiming it at. Schedule your posts. Like with Twitter, you can make as many posts on your page and set them at certain times during the week. You cannot do that on your own personal page. Can't schedule posts. It really annoys me. It doesn't really annoy me, but I wish you could. Look at your stats. All of that information is there. If you don't understand half of it, it doesn't matter. Try and get something out of it. And I hate to say this, but it's worth spending a few quid with Facebook sometimes if you really want to push something. If you have something of merit or worth that you want to share, spend a few pounds and see what the results are like. Don't look at Facebook's suggested amounts, which are normally in the hundreds. Just spend a fiver or a tenner. It won't break the bank but you'll be able to see what the engagement is like and you'll get used to setting up adverts. There is one rule of thumb that I will tell you. You've probably seen this button, the boost button, which you may have seen on your posts. Boosts are a waste of time. All boosts are doing is they are encouraging you or encouraging the audience to like it or read it or comment on it. They are not engaging with it. They are not sharing it necessarily. If you've got a join my website link, boosting it will make no difference. You've got to start using the specific advert manager in Facebook to create the kind of adverts you want. And I'll go back to my other slide. If, this, if you've listened to this going, I have no idea what he's talking about. I have no intention or incentive to do this. Find someone that can help you. Because if you don't understand social media, there are thousands of others that do and they'll be ahead of the game. So find people to help you. Right, very quickly, Goodreads. Who's got a Goodreads page? A few people, okay. I haven't really bothered with Goodreads, but actually it's really useful. Uh, primarily, oops, primarily because there are a lot of message boards and forums on there. So you can talk to like-minded readers, authors, you can put uh, previews up of sections, get feedback, um, and one of, the, one of the forums I found was for audiobook promotion. So uh, I'm going to give you another tip before that. This website is, keeps cutting the top of my screen off and I can't see it. We can see it at the top. Can you? Yeah. Oh, you can. All right. Just, yeah. So this website, if you, I, I'll post it up. I found this. Someone has gone through and found, I think it is, the top 500 book reviewers on Amazon. Okay? Spread out across the world. You can message Amazon reviewers direct. Send them an email. 
and say, I've got a book, it's published, I'm looking for some reviews. Would you be interested? If they don't reply, don't bother them again. If they do reply, send them a copy. I've had a few that have replied and left really good reviews, so it's worth doing. Now on Goodreads, when I published the audiobook, I wanted to find some people to leave feedback on the audiobook. So I went on this page, uh, had about 10 people say they were interested, sent them out the code, and I got my first review on um, uh, Audible. Naught stars, right? Naught stars, disappointed. I love this line. I was expecting an inspirational memoir from an individual who succeeded in spite of two rare medical conditions. I did not expect profanity, inappropriate sexual content, and far too many genital stories. And as a friend of mine said, how can you have too many genital stories? She was not my audience, unfortunately, but that is the first review I've got on my audio page, and it does not look good. I'm hoping that people will finally go on and go, ignore that, it's great. But that's the pros and cons of asking for reviews. Uh, compare that to other reviews that I've had on Amazon, which are fantastic. And one of the things I would say, if you have a Facebook page, share your reviews. Take a screenshot, share it. Let people know that they're enjoying it. You will get people engaging. One of the problems with the Amazon website is it's not responsive, so you can't shrink it down. So the posts are very wide, and the reviews are quite hard to read on something like Facebook. But that's a screenshot off a mobile phone, and it looks much better and it's much easier to read. It's much easier to take a screenshot on your phone, upload it to your Facebook page. So think about doing that too. Okay, final top tips on social media, and then we'll move on. I'm running behind a bit. Search Amazon's top reviewers. Find books and authors similar. So if you, you know authors that you like that write in a similar style, find the top reviewers in their reviews and contact them direct. Ask before sending, don't be a pest. If they don't want to know, ignore it, otherwise you get a bad rep. Okay, final section, audiobooks. And this is the one that a lot of people I know are really interested in. Anyone here written or published a book? Okay, keep your hands up. Keep your hands up if you have also produced an audiobook of that book. No one, okay? There, are, there is no excuse to not make an audiobook version of your book. And you might think, I don't, I don't know how to do it. I can. Yes, you can do it. It is easy if you know what to do. See, that little boy did it, and he's only three, <laughs> after he'd eaten a load of sand. But. So, my advice is you either do it yourself, or you find someone to help you do it. So what do you need to make an audiobook yourself? Well, you need a microphone. You need a computer, you need a quiet space, and you need a narrator. Now, you're not necessarily going to get Sean Bean, I appreciate, and we'll come on to narrators in a minute. Microphones. If you're going to do it yourself, uh, let's cut it off a bit. Microphone, about £100, £130. Sounds quite expensive, but the quality is fantastic. I use these a lot, and they are very rich and warm. Uh, so, get yourself a good microphone. Get yourself a computer. It doesn't have to be the strongest or most powerful computer in the world, but it needs to be quiet. You don't want to hear it whirring away in the background. A lot of people use Audacity, which is a piece of software for producing an audiobook. It's free. It's not my favorite, personally. I actually use this, which looks far more complicated, but I actually found it a lot easier. This is called Adobe Audition. Uh, my audiobook had uh, sound effects and different voices and narrators, so I needed different lines of audio. And this costs £25 a month. Now that sounds like a lot, but it made me work. Because <laughs> I'm not going to sit on that for a year, and I did it in three months. So it incentivized me to do it. You, if you've got an iPad, there are also audio recorders for iPad as well. You need a quiet space. It's probably the hardest thing to find. You're always going to get noise at home. Uh, but there are rehearsal rooms, for example, in Bristol, which are quiet or studio spaces that you can work with too. 
And you need to think about your narrator, and this is the really important one. Do you want to narrate it, or are you going to find someone that will narrate it for you? And that's the question you need to ask yourself. So mine was a memoir, and it, I did some auditions, which I'll come on to in a minute, but it made pure sense for me to tell my story, because no one else can inflect the way that I know things need to be said, because I wrote it. So if all of that sounds brilliant, go off and do it and make yourself an audiobook. If you actually feel like this, you're like, ah, oh, what, I can't face any of that, then you need to get some help. And the main website for doing this is ACX, acx.com, which is audio... I can't remember what it's called. This is ACX, and if you've got a book already published through Amazon, whether it's an e-book or a print book, you can search the title and claim it as yours. So it's already part of their system. That ACX is owned by Amazon. And once you've claimed it, you can start, uh, you can put a, out a campaign for narrators. Tell them what the book is about, put a sample of the book up, and people will record it at home and send you what they've done. And I tried to find, I thought I had saved some, because some of them, bless their hearts, were so bad. <laughs> It's not their fault, but they just don't, didn't know how to read it in the way that I wanted it. And at that, but I needed to do that for me to realise that I was the only one who could tell it. So once you found your narrator, whoops, sorry, we'll come back to that. Once you found your narrator, if you want to work with them, you can contact them, and then this is where you start to make an agreement. So let's have a look at narrator contracts, which is important. So there are two main options. You can pay them an upfront fee, and that's agreed between the two of you. If you're a first-time author, they will probably want that, because there's no guarantee that a royalty share is going to bring them in any money. You may only sell 10 audiobooks, and they're not going to see much money out of the potentially tens of hours of work that they've put into it. If you do do an audio share, uh, sorry, a royalty share, this is how it works. Remember, Amazon will take 60% of your book cost. So if your book's £20 for an audiobook, they'll take 60% of that. You then split the remaining 40% with the narrator. It doesn't sound very much, does it? And this is why you need to ask yourself, who do I work with as a narrator? What's the best deal I can get? Top narrators will take you know, they'll charge a lot as an upfront fee or they'll want a bigger royalty share. But if you've got Sean Bean, you may sell tens of thousands of copies. You could, these are all the things you've got to weigh up. If you're looking for royalty options, these are your main options, exclusive and non-exclusive. So exclusive means it can only be sold through Audible. You cannot give it away. You cannot put it on your website. You can put a link to Audible on your website, but it must be sold through Audible. Non-exclusive means that there are you, uh, you take less of a share, but you can distribute it in different ways. So if it's exclusive, you get a 40% share. If it's non-exclusive, you take a 25% share. Uh, but like I said, there are more options. And I was looking around, I was like, do you know what? I'm not totally happy with this. And I read the fine print some more. How many years do Audible own your book for if you go through an exclusive contract with them? Seven. Seven years you are tied into an Audible contract. So you need to think about that. And I looked around and I found this website called Author Republic. Author Republic, you still put it up through iTunes, you still put it up through Audible, but you only get 25% but the book is yours. And you can do what you want with it. If you want to give hundreds of copies away, you can. And they also put you in touch with about 20 or 30 other distributors, Barnes & Noble, various others. They may sell none. Audible is the biggest seller of audiobooks. Once you've made your decision, you upload all your files, as you can see here. Uh, you need to make sure they're nice and loud. You need to make sure they've got at least a two second gap at the start and the end. You've got to have some opening credits which have a very set format which you can find out about on the ACX website. 
Uh, and then your book's live. And this is the version on, I can't, what's the book? What's the website? I can't read it. Thank you. So yeah, not, not audible. Um, but there it is. So the audio book goes live. And then you've got to shout about it. So my top tips, identify the narrator. That's really important. Think about whether you want to do it yourself or whether you're going to find a narrator through something like ACX. Negotiate your terms. Do you want to distribute it solely through Audible and ACX or do you want something like the Author Republic? And then promote like hell. You need to shout about it as much as you can. <sighs> right. I think that was a whistle-stop tour. Uh, my final thoughts are, don't be afraid to do it yourself. I really believe that. Now, I'm grateful to the help I've had from Richard as a publisher, but in terms of things like the e-book and the audio book and the promotion, you can do it. It's practice, it's learning by your mistakes, it's going online and watching YouTube's on video and, uh, videos on YouTube and seeing how other people have done it. There are tons of resources out there which will help you and, and develop you. And I'll say it again, if you're stuck, work with someone, pay them some money and get the results that you need. So I've had the last 12 months or so has been massively exciting for me. We had the audio book come out in March. Um, I'm now a um, ambassador for the Pituitary Foundation who are based in Bristol, so I go and talk on their behalf. I am talking at a rare disease conference in Belgrade this November. I am possibly going out to Canada and the States this year to tell my story to, which is really exciting. And you might think, why? Uh, well, you've got to buy the book to find out. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, any questions, I guess? Yes. Dan, first a simple question, which is, um, you mentioned the, the royalty percentages and the split with the narrator, if you go that route, but could you tell us how the prices of your, how the price of your audiobook compares with your print book and your e-book? Okay. From what I can tell, they tend to do it on length. <coughs> so there's a certain band, a tier, if it's say under eight hours, eight to 10 hours, 10 to 12 hours. My audiobook's 12 and a half hours long and it retails for about 22 pounds. Okay. Now don't forget though, if you're an Audible subscriber, you get your one free book for your nine pound a month. So actually it's not 22 pounds, but if you're buying it outright, that's what it would be. So it's worked out on time length. Thank you. Also, um, this is something you told me when we were at the um, Hawkesbury Upton Literary Festival, but I think maybe some of the people here are interested to hear this. I thought, and I said to you, I thought that there was no point actually investing time and money in an audio book until your book was actually selling substantial quantities of print or ebook, whatever. And you said that's not necessarily true. And could you please explain why? What did I, what, what did I say? <laughs> <laughs> why did I say it wasn't necessarily true? I can't remember. You said you're selling to a different audience. You are selling to a different audience. I have people that I go, oh, I've written a book, will you read it? Mm. Audio book? Oh, yeah, 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 no, I'll listen to the audio book. So it's a totally different audience. A lot of people travel, uh, they're in cars a lot, you know, they can't read, but they'll stick audio books on. And it is a different learning, uh, learning experience, a different listening experience as well. Um, so yeah, that is why. And it may be that you actually do your audio book first and publish later. There's nothing to stop you doing that. I don't, I don't see why not. Any other questions? No? Here we end early, Grace. <laughs> Can I oh, ask yes. about things like Instagram? Yeah. Um, well, I struggle with it. So. Yeah, I, I have put stuff up on it, and then I mean, Instagram is so flooded with dinners, cats, makeup, you know, and you and you start getting followed by makeup companies. You're thinking, no, I, you, this is you're spamming me. Um, there are some. There is one really fantastic tool called If That Then This, uh, IFTT, I think it's called. The idea being is, you say, if I post something on Facebook 
then stick it on Instagram as well. So you create this chain of activity, these automated processes that can save you an awful lot of time. It's like if I put a tweet on Twitter, then I want you to share that picture on Instagram as well. So you're saving a, a lot of time in doing it. So there are these quite useful resources out there that help you. Again, it's uh, just it's think about your market. Think who's on Instagram. Who are you appealing to? It's really difficult, though, to get it right. And it's just a bit of experimentation. I, For me, I get the most yield off Facebook. Seven billion users. It's frightening, really, but there you go. Danny, you mentioned um, TweetDeck. Why TweetDeck rather than HootSuite? Um, I think HootSuite is fine as well. Um, I just really love TweetDeck for the Chrome extension element of it. I just find the filtering and I just find it very easy to work with. Uh, I used Hootsuite a while ago. I haven't used it since, so it may have changed, it may have improved. What, what, do you use it? What's your experience? Uh, I use Hootsuite, but I'm not entirely happy with it, so I'm looking for something else. I find it a bit clunky in some respects, and, but, I, but I've not used Tweetdeck for a long time. So, uh, it used to be an, a, a mobile app as well, but yeah. they stopped doing it. Uh, but as, as a Chrome website, it's brilliant. And the, the best thing for me is having all your accounts on there. Yeah. Yeah, great. Um, so you've, you've only written one, you've written this one book. You've done the audio book. You've done the pub version, etc., etc. You've got the physical thing. So what's going to be next? How long ah. can you kind of continue to market one book? Wow. So coming up next is I'm <laughs> probably going to turn it into a one-man show <laughs> and maybe take it to Edinburgh. I'm not joking. So do like a 45-minute version of the show. Now, I kind of quite like the idea of taking my presentation because the presentation works really well, but it is, in essence, just a presentation. I'm, I probably want to work with some dramatists and try and, well, dramatise it into a 45-minute piece of theatre. I think that would work better. But I'm kind of weighing all of these things up. You know, I've literally just spent a year and a half on the audiobook, and I'm like, oh, I'm done now, I'm done. Oh, no, no, let's do a play version, you know. <laughs> let's take it to Edinburgh. So I, I kind of keep reintroducing it. After that, I don't know where, there else, where else there is to go, to be honest. But I think the, you know, the rare conditions are so rare that there, are, there, are all, there is always going to be an interest in it. And I can see myself talking to more medical bodies, rare condition advocates. Um, this is what the trip in the USA and Canada is about, potentially. So I'm telling my story in a way that suits me, uh, and it's kind of keeping it alive. And when I spoke to Pfizer back in March, I took a box of books with me, didn't think they'd buy maybe one or two, and they bought the entire box in one go and said, we're going to give this out to all our staff, they should read it as research. And I was like, <laughs> okay. Fantastic. But you know, I, you don't know where these things will go, so. And also, I think with, with lots of people, so small businesses are actually producing um, maybe non fiction books. Yeah. Actually, uh, um, actually getting a lot of sort of um, traction on non fiction. Yes. Because, was, and, and there's like lots of um, sort of follow on things that happen as a result of just having actually a physical book in that you can actually. Yeah, and I think memoir writing is getting bigger and bigger. You know, a lot of people have a lot of stories to tell. How much desire there is for that, it's whether it becomes pulp at some point or not, I don't know. But people have got stories to tell. And I never thought I would do this, ever. So, yeah, I'm, I'm really pleased that I've had the opportunity. And I, it's a perverse thing that, you know, if I hadn't been born with these conditions, I wouldn't be stood here, probably. So you have to take the positives with the negatives. Both of these things get added on, you know. You don't realise. I mean, recently I went to a meeting where they were discussing a, a, uh, a show that's going to be uh, done at the museum here in Bristol. And they asked if anyone had any information on disabilities in Bristol. And I put your book on the list of books on disability that I handed to her and pointed out that you were a Bristol person. Do you want to become my agent? No, that's... <laughs>
That's brilliant. But Bristol, thank you very much for doing that. I'm very grateful. And I think Bristol's great for that, to sort of, you know, try and raise as much awareness as we can. And it is difficult, Did, you know, to look, to look at me, to some extent, you wouldn't think I had a disability because I have two hidden conditions. So you, it's not always noticeable. And I don't necessarily want to shout about them either. So I just point people to the book and say, this will explain it all. But thank you very much. Uh, it's really exciting. I've had people, somebody noticed a book uh, in a, on a library shelf uh, or in a charity shop up north somewhere. So, you know, how these books end up in all these different places, I don't know. But it's, it's really gratifying when they do. But thank you. That's brilliant. It's about the, um, yeah. the microphone thing. I'm, I'm in radio. So I already have a quite expensive bit of kit. But you're, are you suggesting just to just use a... Uh, if you've got the kit, use it. Right. I'm suggesting for those who are doing a DIY approach, you don't have to spend a fortune, and a good USB microphone will pr produce a really nice, warm recording. The difficulty sometimes is the consistency. You need to be sat in that same room, uh, in the same spot, same distance from the microphone to some extent. And that's not always easy, but if you can go to a studio where that's already set up, They'll put you in the right spot, then you can sit and do it. So working with someone that can help you do it, I think, is key. Uh, yeah, but if you've got professional equipment, yeah, I would absolutely use that. I, I um, to point out, I recorded mine in Portland Square in a, uh, in a small studio up there, and it was great. My top tips for recording audiobooks, have a good breakfast. <laughs> Don't eat cereal, have proteins, because honestly, within half an hour, my stomach was rumbling, and you have to stop every time it rumbles, because yeah. it will pick it up. It's a nightmare, so you need to make sure you feel full. You have to watch your mouth, if it'll pick up all these pops and clicks, and certain drinks. Gin's quite good, actually. I think gin in the morning would have been a better idea, but water can make you, your mouth pop and click sometimes, and it can be really noticeable. But what they'll produce is a really solid sound. And actually, he was reading the book as I was talking about it, and he would stop me and go, you've missed a word. I'd be like, right, OK. So I went back. You may not have that vigilance if you're doing it yourself in your own room. And after an hour or two, your brain gets tired. You, don't, you spot the mistakes. You get a bit lazy. So working with someone that can sort of keep you motivated and, and, and spot these things is really key. It was great fun, though. Um, yeah. So I, I would just do it if you can. I'm just going to say that on the audio book front, I did um, a book with Ira Rainey, um, yeah. uh, Fat Man's Dreamer, which um, did very well as, a, as an audio, still doing very well as an audio book, but uh, we did it with uh, Nick Rawlinson, as all you might know. Yes. Um, and unfortunately, we couldn't, we couldn't uh, find the studio space to do it. Uh, the, the second book is still not found. It. And, uh, but we really struggled with the studio space because unless you're fortunate to work in that arena, it can be quite a considerable expense. Yeah. And you need it for uh, a long time. So we went down the route of uh, auditioning on the basis of the people who are providing the auditions have already got studios. Yeah. And you don't see that cost then. So you're actually getting a studio um, thrown in as well as, yeah. the, as a reading. And for us with the, uh, the second book, it works really, really well. Okay. Because it didn't take us very long to find someone at all. But whether that was a, as a result of having the first book, possibly they could refer to, I don't know. But I think from what I remember as well, they tend to charge on the length of the audio. So it's not how long they necessarily take to record it, it's the finished, finished audio. So whether it's 8, 10, 12, 15 hours, whatever it might be. And yes, you're right, they will have the facilities to do it. Yeah. You just can't be there to monitor it and check it over but sometimes you know what you've got to leave it to someone because as i think you've said in the past that you can get very very precious about it and you start spotting every mistake and that's no that's not quite right it's not quite what i meant leave it by the time the person's heard it they're on to the next sentence and they they didn't even know so you know it's not the same as missing out a full stop in a book but the but the ear doesn't really pick those things up i don't think quite as in as much detail Are we good? Are we done? Everyone happy? Well, if anyone would like a copy, I am selling some at the bargain price of £10. Uh, 
Um, and that's it, really. Thank you very much. Tell me the next when the next normal night is, because I know it's in September, something. 18th. 18th.